Thanks for joining everyone. I'll just wait a couple more seconds so that other people join. Okay, let's make a start. Um, welcome everyone to this event today and um, we're discussing why socialists are anti-imperialist. Um, my name's Amy Smith and I'm one of the regular contributors to Labour Outlook and I'm chairing the event today. So today's forum is organised by Labour Outlook. Um, it's a fast growing website which brings you daily news and views um, from across Labour's left and also from those at the front lines of the movements that are resisting the Tories. So I'm really excited mm -hmm. about our discussion today. It is particularly timely in light of the recent announcements from the Tory government, and um, which are particularly concerned as to how they see Britain's role in the world. Um, so these are recent policies and thinking of things like the massive hikes um, in military spending. Um, and particularly concerning is the um, initiation of a new nuclear arms race being confirmed as part of their pretty clear commitment to taking part in this new Cold War against China, as well as continuing NATO expansion and all of these things make the world a much more dangerous place. It's why it's so important that we are having discussions around this about how we can challenge these policies. It really seems that the government, the Tories have learned nothing from their disastrous imperialist adventures in Afghanistan, which we just marked the 20th anniversary of, and Iraq 18 years ago and Libya 10 years ago. It's also a very necessary discussion in the light of the Labour front benches shift um, towards this kind of foreign policy and away from the more popular anti-war and internationalism put forwards under Jeremy Corbyn's leadership. So to discuss this today, we're joined by Andrew Murray, who's one of the founders of Stop the War Coalition, and also the author of The Fall and Rise um, of the British Left. And he'll be giving an extended contribution in a moment, and we'll also have a short contribution from Sam Browse from Live Outlook. Um, one of the things that I really like about these events is not just a chance for you to hear these great ideas, but for you to take part as well. Um, so please, if you've got any questions for either of our speakers and any co comments, please post those um, in the Q&A function on Zoom um, throughout the, and I'll remind you as we go along throughout the event as well. Um, we'll have time for a few rounds of questions from each of the speakers um, from after, the, after Sam's spoken. Um, and also during the event, if you could um, tweet Labour Outlook, that's at Labour Outlook, and do follow us on Facebook as well. So now over to our first speaker, Andrew Murray. Okay, thank you uh, very much, Amy. Uh, you're absolutely right. This is an important issue for us to be discussing uh, right now. Um, I think how important it is was indicated by a member of Labour's front bench recently who said it is time that the party dropped its obsession with anti-imperialism. Now, that member of Labour's front bench was an MP uh, called Wayne David. He's actually the shadow minister for um, the Middle East and North Africa. So it's probably relevant to say that Wayne David voted for the Iraq war. He voted for the uh, Libyan war. Uh, he voted to intervene in Syria and he broke the Labour whip under Jeremy Corbyn to vote uh, against a motion that would have prohibited arms sales to Saudi Arabia because of the war in Yemen. So at the moment, Labour has, uh, as its leading spokesman for the Middle East and North Africa, uh, a politician whose um, voting record shows he thinks the problems of that region are best uh, addressed by military intervention, bombing, arming dictatorships to um, uh, attack their neighbours uh, and so on. So I think most people in the world would say it is the obsession with imperialism, not anti-imperialism, that is not just a, um, a threat to Labour's political interests, but also to the rest of the world. And that is why I think um, battle has to be rejoined uh, on this uh, on this issue. Uh, I mean, no one in the wider world is thinking Labour should be less anti-imperialist. 
but uh, that is a current within the party itself, which can only get encouragement, even though it's not exactly the same thing, from all this talk about um, flag waving uh, and um, uh, you know ha having a strong line on national security that is now being generated around the uh, Starmer uh, leadership. Now, anti-imperialism was, as, as you said, Amy, a core part of the uh, Corbyn project, the, the policies associated with Jeremy Corbyn. I would say that of all the, you know, uh, policies associated with Jeremy, that's possibly the one he had the greatest personal commitment with, I mean, along, along with his commitments to tackle poverty and inequality uh, in, in Britain. The idea that this was unpopular or would lead to political uh, a disaster for Labour was shown to be wrong. Uh, I would say we ought to just recall the aftermath of the uh, dreadful Manchester bombing during the 2017 general election, uh, when a, a terrorist um, originally from Libya blew himself up at the uh, Ariana Grande concert and killed uh, more than 20 young people. We had, a, we had a big discussion in Jeremy's campaign uh, at the time, as you'd expect, as to how to respond to this. Uh, there were a number of people I regard as comrades who felt we should just stick to the conventional condemnation of terrorism, must do more to stop it and leave it at that. Uh, there were people in the Labour apparatus, it's since been revealed, who had worse views, who said all normal people regard terrorism as a consequence of immigration, and that's where Labour should be. Now, of course, Jeremy took a different view, and he made a speech that while condemning the Manchester bombing unreservedly and not excusing the perpetrator in any sense at all, said the fact that terrorism is still happening is a consequence of some of the foreign policy decisions Britain has made, the wars we've engaged in. The war on terror has been a failure. We're still having terrorist attacks. Indeed, the number may be increasing after, at that point, 17 years, 16 years of, a, uh, of the war on terror. And, of course, the Tories jumped all over this position, as we knew they would try to, to say this is... Uh, uh, Jeremy Corbyn attacking Britain again, and they had to drop it because opinion polling showed uh, more than two thirds of the public agreed with the position that Jeremy was taking. That actually, uh, the uh, uh, you know th this is in part due uh, to the consequences of British foreign policy decisions um, that have had an impact uh, around the world, and the Tories then had to drop that line uh, of uh, attack. So the idea that, uh, that, that the anti-imperialism of, of Jeremy Corbyn was in any sense uh, a liability is at best unproven uh, and at worst uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely false. There is, however, now also a different view uh, on the left that says basically that, that doesn't disagree with that argument but says we should forget the whole thing. It's just too difficult. We should concentrate on domestic radicalism, separate um, you know, our domestic policies entirely from international um, policy, and on the latter, just go along with the status quo. This is a, a viewpoint, I think it's fair to say, that has been quite strongly argued by Paul Mason, for example, who writes in the New Statesman and elsewhere, and was for a period, uh, quite involved uh, in, uh, in the Corbyn uh, project. And I think that is a position on the left that we need to uh, grapple with. Of course, at, at one sense, or several senses, uh, it, it, it is obviously wrong. Uh, the same people that advocate this often quite rightly say we're in an age of globalization, international problems are increasingly interconnected, you can't do much, you know, without you know, addressing what's happening in the rest of the world. And yet they try and then bifurcate domestic and foreign policy uh, in Britain. It's clearly a divisive position uh, since uh, it uh, ignores um, the rights or can lead to ignoring the rights of people elsewhere or leave them as the victims of progress in Britain uh, if we have a, 
uh, a left government that still just um, uh, in the phrase gives the generals what they want or regards it as too challenging to try and both nationalize the water industry uh, at the same time as uh, uh, challenging uh, some of the policies followed by NATO. They think we just have to forget about the uh, uh, the NATO issue, we'll go along with the status quo. And this is a position that ends up uh, effectively, uh, it, it's not just a sort of anti-anti-imperialist position, it ends up as a pro-imperialist position uh, because uh, you end up you know, going along with NATO expansion, going along with confronting China, going along with the other uh, uh, signifiers, main, main signifiers of Western uh, dominant trends in Western foreign uh, policy. So I think this is a position that we do have to uh, 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 do have to challenge and we have to try and assert the importance of anti-imperialism to a socialist party and to any prospect of a radical government. So I think we should begin on, in that respect by saying there's three things imperialism isn't. It isn't over, it isn't just over there, and it isn't just a policy. It isn't over in the sense as a popular view that imperialism ended with the formal possession of colonies. It didn't, uh, it carries on uh, to this day. It's a protean phenomenon, uh, imperialism. Uh, and uh, we can see its impact around the world now. It isn't something that just happens uh, somewhere else. It's not something Britain does to, to other countries or Britain and America, our imperialist powers do to other countries. It also profoundly impacts on our own society. And it isn't just a policy, you know, although it isn't, it isn't only a policy, that you can have policies that tend that way, but it's also something systemic, something that is you know, weaved in uh, to the nature uh, of our uh, uh, of our society. Um, now, as to as to what it is, I mean, it's not a sort of unchangeable thing. Uh, I don't think one can simply uh, look at imperialism and do what I call sort of tick box Leninism. That one goes back to the criteria outlined by Lenin and others a hundred years or more ago, and just transpose them uh, unchanged to today's uh, world. I mean, the best definition of imperialism, or the most useful one I ever found, was written by a British Marxist historian called Victor Kiernan, who said that imperialism may be said to display itself in coercion exerted abroad by one means or another to extort profits above what simple commercial exchange can procure. That's a good starting point, I think. It brings together the exploitative aspect of imperialism with the, uh, with the coercive. Uh, and um, we're now in a, a a world where uh, perhaps the some of the features of imperialism of 100 years ago, particularly those pertaining to rivalry amongst the great powers, have to be modified because we have a, a system, a new world order that particularly emerged after 1991, dominated by the USA, but giving a privileged place to Britain and a few other countries uh, as well, that uh, there are more there are more elements of a sort of collective imperialism emerging there, although that's not a uh, a, you know, a completely a sort of black and white uh, question. So I'd like to touch on some of the ways in which imperialism impacts in Britain. Uh, I mean, I think probably this uh, audience will be aware enough of the way it impacts in uh, the rest of the world in terms of the war on terror uh, and the global uh, inequalities that the new world order uh, sustains and reproduces. But in Britain, if we look at the uh, the role of the City of London, a, a key issue and the uh, extraordinary domination that finance capital has in, in British uh, industry, something that is rooted way back uh, in the earliest days of British uh, capitalism and the city becoming a sort of global hub for, uh, for uh, uh, finance, for investment and trade, and something that remains the case today, where despite having an economy, Britain's economy, that is a fraction the size of that of the US today, the city of London is basically comparable to Wall Street and New York in terms of its, uh, uh, of its uh, role. So you have a, a, an economy that is, uh, to some large extent, sort of parasitic on what is being produced elsewhere uh, in the world, and is utterly integrated into this new world order. And, uh, and the means needed to sustain it, the military means and so on, the, 
know, need to intervene militarily all over the world because that helps keep the money flowing through the city of London. And if you're going to address the city of London and its overweening role in the economy, uh, the British economy, you are addressing uh, imperialism. Now, secondly, if we look at uh, racism, perhaps that is a, a more straightforward one, the roots of racism uh, in, um, uh, in, in British imperial attitudes, which were founded on ideas of uh, racial superiority, or as well, and this is particularly resonant on the left, of ideas of British exceptionalism, that British Britain had a particularly uh, elevated role to play in the world, uh, often cast in moralizing terms, of which Tony Blair was the um, uh, an exemplar, uh, that, you know, the, the racism that has been challenged by Black Lives Matter uh, is part, um, is rooted in the empire. Uh, and, uh, of course, as the, the great anti-racist writer Sivan Anden said, we are here because you are there. I mean, we, you know, the, uh, the black population in Britain, BAM population, uh, is largely drawn from places that were well within living memory still, colonised uh, by Britain, subject to the authoritarian rule of the British Empire. And it's good that the statue of Edward Colston is pulled down from its pedestal, but British society has at least one foot on that same uh, uh, on that same pedestal, and if if I was looking at racism today, not just the historical, effort, but whether it is the Windrush, the way the Windrush uh, 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 people were treated, uh, or the rampant Islamophobia, which is probably the main form of racism in Britain today that is regarded as almost uh, uh, legitimate, uh, those are not only rooted in empire but they are reinforced by imperialism today. I mean, you can't separate Islamophobia from the war on terror, which has been almost entirely directed at uh, countries, Muslim majority uh, countries. If we look at the economy, I mean, how the big role that is played in politics uh, by the uh, arms industry, which accounts for an increasingly large portion of manufacturing industry, or the big oil monopolies like BP and Shell, how they uh, capacity to shape British foreign policy, including towards Saudi Arabia, the other Gulf states. If one talks about rebalancing the economy or moving to uh, a greener economy, one is there bumping up against uh, imperialism and that those interests that have driven uh, an aggressive foreign policy. Uh, you know, the, the uh, inflated military spending, the possession of a nuclear deterrent and the fact that we're having to meet a 2% NATO target for uh, military uh, spending because we're taking part in a, uh, a block NATO that uh, really long since lost its uh, ostensible purpose uh, and uh, is responsible for the wars in Yugoslavia uh, and was involved in Afghanistan uh, and in uh, Libya. Uh, so this military spend, this diversion of military resources far beyond, far greater than anything that is needed for the proper defence uh, of uh, Great Britain. Climate change, uh, you can't tackle that uh, without looking at the international balance of economic power, the depletion of the world's resources uh, by uh, big monopoly businesses. And one, one could even extend it further to things like authoritarianism and populism being rooted in outlooks that were shaped by empire and are reinforced uh, by this sense of having to defend a privileged place in the world. So I would say that you cannot talk about changing British society without addressing these issues. And it's better to do it consciously as part of a plan that integrates domestic change with foreign policy than sort of do it unconsciously in a sort of blind sort of way. Uh, Anti-imperialism is no longer, uh, well, never was, but it's certainly not now, it's not an act of philanthropy that we ought to do uh, because uh, it's a sort of favour to people uh, elsewhere. Of course, we, we ought to do it because of the damage that has been done to people across the world by the violent uh, military uh, uh, operations, uh, buttressing an unequal world order, but also it impacts here at home. And it is no longer just jargon uh, imperialism. It may have slightly had that quality perhaps uh, in the 80s and 90s, but the, you know, the wars of this century have, have put it back at the centre of popular understanding, and people do uh, understand it. And failure to grapple with this is not just a matter of not atoning for the past, even the recent past, although 
when I was asked by journalists, what was my proudest moment when I was working for Jeremy Corbyn? Well, the answer is when he apologized for the Iraq war on behalf of the Labour Party in 2016. I think that was uh, a great moment. He delivered on a, a pledge he'd made in the, uh, his leadership election to do, to do that. So it's not just about the past again, it's about now we are in a situation where the uh, America on almost bipartisan basis is looking to confrontation with Russia, confrontation with China. These are evidently far more dangerous confrontations than the sort of neo-colonial wars amongst uh, against smaller countries, bad as those uh, were. And if we don't have uh, an outlook that reshapes Britain's uh, place in the world and the foreign policy we want a Labour government to follow, that challenges the assumptions on which it has been based, challenges the banalities of the national security uh, agenda, uh, does not set out to give the generals what they want, integrates that with uh, domestic policy, then um, if, if, we, if, if a government does not do that, it will fail, uh, in my uh, opinion. So uh, to slightly paraphrase Trotsky, who I don't quote very often, but he was the money here, uh, you may not be interested in imperialism, but imperialism is interested uh, in you. Uh, and that is why uh, uh, socialists uh, today, as 100 years ago, uh, have to put uh, anti-imperialism at the heart of their outlook. Thank you. Thanks so much, Andrew. That was um, really interesting and what a great quote to finish on. I mean, you're absolutely right. Imperialism is not is not over. And the way in which our foreign policy and domestic policy is so inextricably linked. Um, and we need to start thinking about this British exceptionalism and the way in which we can start to challenge that because it, it replicates and sustains um, that um, those racist imperialist tones in our culture, through our education system, in our health system. Um, in ways that you've described there as well. Um, so how we can begin to challenge that in our movements, in our party um, and within the broader public is so important. Um, so maybe we can get on some questions on that later on. And just a reminder to everybody watching, if you have questions for Andrew, please post those in the Q&A box. Um, don't raise your hand, we can't take them that way. Please put them in the Q&A box as well. Um, now we've got around 300 people watching. Um, so from all over the country, let me just take a check at this. And we've got people from Sheffield, London, uh, Durham, Cumbria, Keith Lakes down the road from me, uh, Southampton, but also abroad as well from Chile and, and Belgium too. So hello to all of you watching from there. Now, I'm just going to hand over um, briefly to Patrick Foley, who's a Labour Outlook contributor. And he's going to tell us a little bit more about today's organisers and then we'll, we'll hear from Sam Brown. OK, Patrick. Thanks, Amy, and, and thank you, Andrew. That was really, really informative. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Patrick Foley. I'm from Labour Outlook. And I just wanted to take two minutes just to tell you about Labour Outlook, uh, ask for your support and tell you what's coming up on the horizon. Um, so Labour Outlook is a voluntary led media outlet that shares positive news and views on socialism, internationalism, movement building. And we share a lot of voices of people from across our movement who are resisting the Tories on the day to day. Uh, we have regular Labour contributors who include Claudia Webb, John McDonnell, Richard Burgeon, Apsana Begum, uh, John Tricker and, and many others, uh, and many others who aren't MPs as well. Um, and yeah, so please do follow us uh, on Twitter and on Facebook and check out the website because we have a lot of articles coming out and we actually have a lot of articles covering this exact topic that our volunteers will be putting through the chat uh, as the event goes on. I'd also like to take a minute just to ask for your support and to ask if anyone can give us £10 or anything they can afford in donations to help us cover the costs of this event. Um, Organising these events does cost money, it does cost time, uh, and we, we are a voluntary-led organisation, so we want, we want as much support as possible to be able to keep doing what we're doing, keep putting out good articles on, on the right topics and trying to shift the narrative within Labour Party and outside it as well. Um, so yeah, just to reiterate, anything you can give or £10 would be fantastic. And the donate link should be in the chat on the Zoom function. And if you're watching on YouTube, it should be in the chat in there as well. Um, finally, I'd like to just tell you a little bit about what we've got coming up. So as well as this Labour Outlook Forum, uh, we, we hosted one, I think, last month, and we've got two on the horizon. So our, our next Labour Outlook Forum is being held on why socialists support global Palestine resistance. 
and that's going to be held with Hugh Lanning from the Palestine Solidarity Campaign, as well as other speakers. Um, it's taking place on the 22nd of May, and the volunteers will be putting some more details about that in the chat. So really do add that to your diary and check it out if, if you're interested. We're, we're also going to be hosting one on why socialists support a united Ireland, and that's going to be with Sinn Féin MP Chris Hazard and others. That's a little bit further in the future. That's taking place on Saturday, 3rd of July. But again, our volunteers will be posting that in the chat shortly. Um, and finally, our, our um, we, Labour Outlook supports a RISE Festival and, and, and works with RISE Festival on a, a number of events. And this Friday, on the eve of the of May Day, we're, get, we're going to be joining a, a rally with Tribune magazine as well. And it's called Socialism, Unity and Internationalism. And it, there's guests from all over the world. We've got guests from France, Portugal, Ghana, Brazil, and others, as well as some familiar faces joining us from our own movement here in the UK, Jeremy Corbyn, Apsana Begum, and, and Richard Bergen, among, among others. So again, that's this Friday. Um, our volunteers will post details in the chat. So yeah, please do check it out. And thank you all for joining us today. Thanks so much, Patrick. Um, okay, so now we're on to our final speaker, who is Sam Browse. He's a contributor to Labour Outlook, and he's going to be making a short contribution. Um, so just to remind you, if you've got any questions for either of our speakers, for Andrew or Sam, please put the questions and comments in the Q&A section. Okay, over to Sam. Thanks, Chair. Um, why socialists are anti-imperialists? Um, it's become an article of faith, I think, um, for, all party, uh, for all wings of the Labour Party, from its socialist wing, uh, through to its social democratic soft left, um, to its Blairite wing, that it's an internationalist party. Um, and that much agreement, I think, should make anyone suspicious. <laughs> because either the word internationalism is a platitude, which I don't think it is, um, or what it means is something very different to the different people who use it. So I think the critical question uh, for socialists isn't are we internationalists, but whose interests are served by our internationalism? Even our opponents are internationalists these days. In domestic politics, what differentiates us, say, from liberals who are on paper at least opposed to poverty um, is that socialists know that it's the product of a, um, of a system of class exploitation. The irre irreconcilable interests of the people who sell their labour to live versus a ruling class who buy that um, labour to make a profit. But that ruling class also organises itself on an international level. It shapes international economic institutions like the World Bank and the IMF according to its interests. And it organises itself militarily, as Andrew has alluded to, through groups like NATO. It's that organisation of a ruling class on an international scale that we call imperialism. And of course, the superpower that leads in organising those imperial interests on the world stage is, um, is the US. It's not by chance that the most consistent opponent of democracy in the global south is the State Department, because people don't willingly volunteer to be the subject of extractive economic policies. And it might seem a bit tedious, um, to rehearse these fundamentals. Um, I'm sure many people on the call are familiar with them, but it's important to get back to those basics, I think, if only to say that socialism on the international stage isn't just internationalism. And just as we're not liberals who wring our hands about poverty, it's also not just wringing your hands about the world's poor and oppressed or taking a passing interest in what happens abroad. A socialist foreign policy is explicitly and avowedly anti-imperialist because it actively opposes the global system of imperial exploitation, joins in solidarity and organises with the forces around the globe who are fighting against that system and advances the interests of the many, not the few, to borrow a recent phrase, uh, on the world stage. And that's important because rather than draw a dividing line between the world's working and oppressed classes on the one hand and imperialism on the other, the foreign policy debate in the UK today is now centering around a very different polarisation. Uh, the one that uh, Andrew alluded to earlier on, a new Cold War against China, which is being led by the US. And the ideological packaging of that has been, you know, this narrative of the open, liberal and democratic West versus the closed, authoritarian, even censorious East. I think you only really have to examine the recent history of US diplomatic and covert interventions into Latin America. Um, into Venezuela, Ecuador, Bolivia, Brazil, Honduras, and the kind of ongoing war of attrition against Cuba, to see that the idea of the US as a global uh, purveyor of democracy and human rights is a complete nonsense. 
And no one could credibly claim that the US military interventions of the last 30 years, um, whether that's Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya or Syria, in fact, any before the last 30 years, served anyone but the economic and political interests of the large multinational corporations. And it's exactly those interests that are served by these latter day cold warriors in the UK. Whose interest does it really serve to plough billions into becoming the NATO bulwark against the East in Europe? Whose interest does it serve to plough billions into a nuclear stockpile that could annihilate the planet and everyone on it in moments? And in whose interest is it uh, to plough billions into, a built, into building a supercarrier and sending it halfway around the world to patrol the South Pacific? All those actions do is irresponsibly raise the stakes in a competition which is initiated by the US based ruling elite, um, hoping to stall its relative decline in the world. And actually which has had nothing but a reactionary role to play um, in global politics. And as Andrew's alluded to, and actually talked about in, in depth, there are some siren voices um, on the left who say we should put aside the sort of unpopular baggage of our anti-imperialism and focus on the bread and butter issues of the economy instead. But, and let's ignore actually for a moment, the thousands of people on the streets this last year of all years in the middle of a pandemic, protesting against Britain's colonial legacy. And actually uh, yeah, that, that, that kind of tide of popular opinion Andrew talked about that swept behind Corbyn's comments in the, in the wake of the Manchester bombing. If we're serious about the British working class ever forming a government that speaks for its interests, it's absolutely absurd to say that that should, government shouldn't have its own independent foreign policy. You can't deliver for the many at home if you're on the side of the few abroad, because the politics of imperial power play out in our own domestic debates. Um, about race and immigration and about cultural symbols like flags and statues. And the domestic project of the imperial powers has always been to form an alliance with one section or section, sections of its own working class. And they do that materially, um, using the, the imperial plunder of the world to feather bed some sections of workers and ideologically too, through either a banal or overtly racist nationalism um, or, or the muscular liberalism that Andrew has taken apart here and elsewhere. Um, I think a strategy of accommodating to the current Tory project of rehabilitating empire and flag isn't only morally, 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 morally wrong, but it's also self-defeating. Bending to the flag waving nationalism or choosing to remain silent on racism or the persecution of migrants makes it harder to fight back when that ruling class turns on you, which it will. Because racism and flag waving is what the British ruling class rely on when they're trying to put, um, push through an agenda that attacks the majority of workers. So bending to it just weakens your case um, for a more progressive econ economic policy in the long run. The chorus of rural Britannia will always be louder coming and stronger, in fact, coming from the Tory benches. Um, and in any case, we won't change the tune um, by singing the same song as they are. We need a foreign policy for peace and disarmament that addresses the real international crises we face. Andrew talks about the climate emergency, but there's also the millions of refugees fleeing war and persecution, the pandemic, and the global public health crises that we'll face in the future. Rather than take the side of the aggressor, um, and with actually with a military budget of um, 732 billion, uh, that's more than the next 10 countries, including Russia and China combined, the US is definitely the aggressor in all of this. Our policy should embrace a new multi multipolar world and engage constructively with it to address those challenges. We should be unilateral in our policy of disarmament and we should be multilateral in our international relations. So ignore those siren voices. Our internationalism isn't their internationalism. Our alliance isn't with our own, own ruling class against the rest of the world. It's with all those fighting to liberate themselves from imperialism and the international rule of capital. Because comrades, whether it's a picket outside a workplace in Manchester, a march on the streets of Quito, or a demonstration at a checkpoint in the occupied West Bank, together we fight, and in the long run, it's only together that we rise. Thanks very much, Jeff. Thanks, Sam, that was really good. Um, you heard one phrase in there about what the party's doing at the moment, this rehabilitation of empire and, and flag, which is um, on one hand surprising and also not surprising to me, um, but after the events of last year with BLM and it's such a reductive way to talk about our class interests and patronizing to address the class in that way as well um, so I think that was a really good um, discussion of that thank you Sam
Okay, so we're on to the Q&A portion of this. Um, as I'm asking um, Andrew and Sam these questions, if anybody has any other questions, please post those in the Q&A section. We'll have questions in rounds. So we've got four questions for the first round. I'll read all four out and then I'll come to Andrew and then to Sam for their response to these questions. And after that, we'll take another round of questions as well. Okay, so the first question we've got, um, Boris Johnson has said he wants to make Britain match fit for wars and increase the UK's nuclear weapons stockpile from the current approximate 195 to 260. And we've repeatedly seen a test of leadership, which is a willingness to press the nuclear button. So what opportunities are there for changing this and for creating a nuclear free world? The second question. Um, so this also comes after the Conservatives shut the uh, Iraq historic allegations tribu tribune in 2017. And in 2019, the BBC Panorama investigated how allegations of war crimes by Britain were not being properly investigated. So Pete on this Zoom call has asked, how can we as campaigners take this forward? Now, the last two questions, thirdly, um, there are a number of questions around the position of Labour's leadership, um, including um, questions from people in the call today, including Stan and others on Facebook, are, what do you think the dangers are in the current Labour leadership's foreign policy as set out by Open Labour, John Healy and Lisa Nandy? And finally, um, I think it's pronounced Marta on YouTube, is asking about the link between racism and imperialism. And others are also asking about the growing focus on China and the increase in reports of hate crime and abuse directed at Chinese people here. So do you think there is a risk of the rise um, that we saw similar to the rise of Islamophobia in the run-up to interventions in the Middle East. Okay, thanks very much. So we'll come to you, Andrew, first for your responses. Okay, well, a very broad list of important uh, uh, questions there. I mean, the, the first seemed to be about the Tory government's plans and making Britain match fit for war. Well, I mean, there is uh, an element of um, obviously bombast and bravado in everything Boris Johnson uh, says. Um, I mean, Britain would clearly play, I think, a relatively small role in any military confrontation, God forbid, with uh, China. Um, we are sending uh, one of our aircraft carriers there as a demonstration of our commitment to the confrontation with China. But I don't think you'll have any airplanes actually on it until um, the Americans supply some. Uh, but uh, Britain is, is, is clearly basically uh, uh, all too match fit for wars, as we've seen this uh, this century. I remember the New World Order was supposed to be an era of, um, uh, you know, peace and stability. And Britain has been engaged in wars in Yugoslavia, Afghanistan, uh, Iraq, Libya, Syria, and only slightly indirectly in Yemen. Um, so, uh, you know, there's, there's, Britain is already uh, a uh, hypertrophied military power. I'm not sure where we now rank in military spending, but it's definitely very, um, very high up. Uh, and none of these wars were anything to do with any actual threat to Britain. They were all part of maintaining uh, a world order as a leading ally of the USA that disproportionately benefits uh, rich and powerful nations and their, uh, and their businesses. Uh, so I think we need to uh, campaign vigorously against the Tory foreign policy uh, and uh, uh, expose the pretensions and hypocrisies on which it's based. Uh, and it would be better if the Labour Party didn't drift into a position of bipartisan um, uh, support for some of its key elements. Now, on the war crimes by Britain, uh, well, as to what we can uh, do to bring this forward, I mean, all we can do is lobby uh, government and draw attention to the uh, atrocities that uh, have been committed by uh, elements of uh, the British uh, armed forces. We sign up to these international laws and conventions and were very um, loud in holding other countries to their obligations uh, under them, uh, very vigorous. Uh, and so we ought to expect that um, Britain's armed forces conduct themselves to the same standards and are held to it when they, uh, when they fall short. I mean, of course, you know, my view, I think Stop the War's view, was that the war crime in Iraq was the Iraq war. That was the crime. The criminals were the politicians who ordered it. 
uh, and, uh, you know, things done by soldiers there, um, bad as they may have been in some cases, they are really the instruments of the policy. They are not the, uh, the policy itself, and it's the policy that was the, that was the um, uh, crime. Uh, in the dangers of Labour's uh, foreign policy, well, it, the danger is of repeating the past, because once you get stuck into a, uh, the conventional framework of accepting national security as defined by the establishment, um, uh, you know, by the you know, right wing media, uh, and once you prioritise the alliance with the USA above all other considerations, you are going to get locked into a policy of, uh, of war. It's not inevitable that you do, uh, but it becomes very much more likely. And the, and the danger now is the focus of US foreign policy on a bipartisan basis appears to be confronting China, first of all, and secondarily put it, pushing back against Russia. Uh, and Britain has troops deployed on the Russian border. As I said, we're sending uh, an aircraft carrier to uh, the far uh, east. Uh, you know, the dangers are we will get locked into uh, a military confrontation is far more serious than the ones we've seen so far, which is why, you know, uh, Labour, Lisa Nandy uh, and, and Keir Starmer have to think through an independent view of what the interests of Britain uh, are and break with this imperial uh, mindset. And finally, on the, the question of racism and imperialism, I think the connection is fairly obvious to most people. Uh, the British Empire was uh, had as its foundational value racial supremacy, an idea of racial supremacy uh, that gave uh, uh, Britain the right to rule an un authoritarian, uh, undemocratic, and very frequently brutal and occasionally genocidal way uh, over people of different uh, uh, races. and. Uh, 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 racism is a foundational construct of uh, uh, imperialism, and it is reproduced today with the wars uh, that we fight, which require the demonization primarily now uh, of, uh, uh, of Muslims, uh, Muslims in Britain, uh, as well as uh, abroad. Uh, and uh, it's absolutely right, hate crimes against Chinese have risen against Asian Americans in uh, the USA. Uh, whether that will reach the same dimensions as Islamophobia in Britain, probably, uh, probably not. Um, uh, but uh, but it's another it's another expression of a, a racist ideology, which is it's also expressed in the attitude of uh, many in British politics towards China. Uh, I mean, why a, a country that we went to war with twice to maintain the right to sell opium to its people? This was an early example, not the war on drugs, it was the war for drugs. Uh, and uh, why um, they think the Chinese people need lectures on human rights from Britain uh, is uh, beyond me. Thanks very much, Andrew. And Sam, go over to you for your responses. Uh, yeah, on the first question, um, I think, uh, uh, Andrew, you kind of covered the, the match fit stuff. Um, I think, I, I, want to become on the kind of nuclear point because actually it wasn't something I want something I wanted to talk about more in like the my initial contribution but actually it's it, it is completely wild that the, the, <laughs> that the um you know that the government is seeing as a priority like to increase a nuclear stockpile of weapons as um you know it's and, and kind of breaks with all our kind of treaty obligations it's a complete waste of money um also, too, just to re-emphasise the point that Andrew made, too, our, our whole nuclear weapon system is so integrated with the US one anyway. Um, you know, it's uh, again going back to that question: whose interest does this serve? It doesn't. It doesn't really serve Britain's strategic interests. We couldn't fire a nuclear weapon if we wanted to on our own anyway. We have to get the permission from the US to do it. Um, to do it in any case. So those those things are completely integrated. Um, yeah. So actually, um, you, you know, that's. I think that's something we should absolutely oppose. Um, and, and, and make that kind of a, a central part of our opposition to the government's foreign policy. Um, not least because it makes the world a more dangerous place to live as well. Um, <laughs> kind of the threatening, <laughs> the looming threat of imminent nuclear annihilation is not, is not something that's good for anyone. Um, on the second question of uh, war crimes um, not being properly investigated, actually I think there are quite a few um, uh, opportunities to really push on that front right now, um, especially, I mean, I'm just thinking just last week, um, the Overseas Operations Bill 
amendments from the Lords came back, um, which was, you know, in the bill, what the, what the government are effectively trying to do is um, it, it seek impunity for soldiers who commit war crimes abroad. Um, and that they've, they, they caved. I mean, for some Conservative minister, um, ministers, it was too much even to say that, um, that uh that soldiers serving british soldiers serving abroad um shouldn't um should be indicted for um crimes against humanity and torture um where the government fell short um in kind of its its kind of response to a laws amendment was including war crimes as well um and that that provoked huge uh, huge outrage uh, out, outrage people you know pe people understood what that meant and so i think there is there is um there is something we can tap into to that into there um especially actually uh, linking that to not only kind of and, and making those connections between the domestic and the international as well. So on the one hand, you have a, um, the kind of overseas operations bill, which is pushing a, um, a international um, agenda of human rights violations. Um, but again, that, that things like the, um, the spy cops bill, um, the policing bill, all of these things are bringing into question like the legitimacy, the legitimacy of state actors in committing violence against groups of people. And I think there's a, a job of work that the left needs to do um, in linking that discussion, you know, um, about war crimes committed abroad um, to the war crimes that are committed, well, the war crimes, the human rights violations that are committed at home too. So I think that's, that's something we should be definitely be tapping into um, in our discussion and, and, and linking um, a campaign with the All Group Camp, All Group Fusion Justice for Trump truth and justice campaign linking those things like that like human rights violations abroad to the struggles like all grieve at home i think is really important um on the question of the dangers of kind of nandy and healy's approach to uh, foreign policy i think there are there are kind of two one is the sort of um the the, 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 the actual kind of geopolitical implications of it which is that actually joining in this kind of chorus of um which I think is irresponsible, joining in this chorus of um, the West versus the East um, and kind of heightening those tensions, I think is an inherently dangerous thing to do um, and, and gives kind of political legitimacy um, to the kind of mo most hawkish people, um, certainly in the US. But also that the other danger is that it, it just smashes all support that we have at home. Like, I, I mean, we're, we've been, the Labour Party have been pursuing a, a flags and beer in pub strategy for the last six months like and we are 14 points behind in the pub like in the polls it's not working why because it's like ripping apart the coalition of people who voted for us like um in 2017 and in 2019 in fact um because unfortunately for kind of the the the, the element of a labor party that wants to turn its back on those kind of anti anti-imperialist politics there is a large section of opinion in the labor vote that supports them like and we're seeing that in things like the ripping down of the colston statue which is what again it's unthinkable that like you know 10 years ago if we were having that kind of discussion like you know the, the, a group of people have spontaneously decided to like <laughs> pull down a, a statue of a slave it's, the discussion has clearly come on and people are aware and they're uh, you know aware and awake um to that history um so i think there are twin dangers there and then finally i think um uh and you kind of, I think, completely nailed it on the race, the relationship with racism and imperialism. What I would do is also kind of supplement that too. I, I, my, lots of my background has been campaigning around Latin America solidarity. And there is also a kind of a, a sort of racism in the, um, and an, a, a kind of, I guess, an exceptionalism that's used to justify interventions into those countries too. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about lawfare yet, later, but the, the idea that these places are banana republics that don't know how to run themselves. And, um, you know, and so, and, and that, that being a sort of like, I don't know, accusations against sort of Ecuador, Bolivia in recent times, ongoing accusations about Venezuela that they don't know how to run their democracies because, you know, they're gung ho. And I think that's very much, race, like, very much kind of rooted in a racist conception of, of politics on, on that continent as well. Um, so yeah, I absolutely, absolutely 100% agree with what Andrew said about Islamophobia, but it's, uh, the, the complexion of racism <laughs> is slightly different in those different parts of the world, depending on the intervention, I guess. Lovely, thanks, Sam. Um, okay, thank you both for your responses there. We've got another round of questions um, with, with three questions this time. Um, so Nick on Zoom has asked, to what extent was or is 
the Washington Consensus, um, which governs the IMF and, and World Bank policies even now, imperialism by other means. Um, and then we've seen Cuba has been one of the countries providing um, international medical support during COVID, for example, sending doctors out to 27 countries. And it's got a history of such support when disasters strike. Yeah, it continues to be under US blockade. The whole of Latin America has been seen by the US as its backyard with a series of coups and sanctions. Um, and comments on YouTube are highlighting um, interventions in Bolivia specifically. So how do you think we can draw attention to the different types of intervention and increase in the standing of economic and proxy wars? And then Frida is asking, um, huge numbers of people demonstrated against the Iraq war, but since then the establishment has pushed back towards normalizing liberal interventionism and preparing the ground for war by constant media campaigns around human rights. Um, how can the peace movement be anti-imperialist? And linked to this final question, um, there are also comments asking about how we counter media and propaganda campaigns that build support for intervention, um, for example, regarding Latin America, Venezuela and China. Um, so we'll go to Andrew first for your responses to those. Yeah, thanks, uh, Amy. Well, I mean, the Washington consensus, of course, is imperialism by other means. I'm not actually sure if it's even by other means. It's just, uh, uh, I mean, the Washington consensus was mandating a, a program for economic governance to be imposed on sovereign states, basically uh, deregulation, privatization, uh, opening up the economy, floating exchange rates, basically throwing open the economy to the domination of uh, transnational corporations, the great majority of them uh, based uh, in the USA, Britain, similar uh, other imperial uh, powers. Uh, and to go back to that definition I quoted from Victor Kiernan, he talked about coercion. Coercion doesn't necessarily mean military, direct military coercion. Uh, it can mean uh, economic coercion, saying either play this way or you're going to be shut out of world trade or the shut out of the possibility of investment. Um, and uh, you could see that when Indonesia, a very large uh, country, a politician, uh, I mean, a population, several multiples uh, of ours, but they were forced to sign an accord with the IMF in the 1990s. And there was a resonant picture of uh, Indonesia's president signing with the director of the IMF, Michael uh, Kamadez, standing there with his arms folded, staring down at him, you know, like, um, you know, you know, like General Gordon uh, in the Empire, you, you know, and, and so it is, it is this coercion. And, and it's backed by the threat of worse. I think it was the New York Times uh, columnist, a sort of centrist consensus uh, blowhard called Thomas Friedman, who said that, uh, that the um, uh, behind the invisible hand of the market was the mailed fist of the US Marines and McDonnell Douglas. Uh, and that sums it up. I mean, you know, it, it's, um, you know, if you don't play our way, uh, you can get um, very badly uh, uh, damaged. I mean, of course, the Washington consensus has been somewhat disgraced since 2008. Um, but the impetus behind it to organise a, a world in the interests of capitalism uh, uh, remains uh, still very, um, very potent. Um, now, th there's a question about the huge dem demonstrations against the Iraq war. Well, of course, we didn't stop the Iraq war, but I think it did make a difference that endures in British politics. Um, there was the war in Libya, uh, it is true. Cameron sort of bent over backwards to try and show how that was different to the uh, Iraq war. I mean, I don't think substantively it was, but of course it didn't um, involve uh, British military boots on the ground uh, in Libya. The first time Cameron wanted to bomb Syria, he was defeated uh, in the House of Commons um, by the Labour Party that imposed a, a whip uh, on the issue uh, by Ed Miliband. And that undoubtedly was due to the resonance of um, uh, the campaign against the uh, Iraq war. So I would think it'd be wrong to say it's made no difference, but it's right to say, as your questioner did, uh, that um, uh, there is continual, there will be an effort to normalise uh, intervention. And, and that is what is going on in the Labour Party. Again, this pamphlet that was produced when I quoted Wayne David, he was speaking in support of this pamphlet by Open Labour, 
is entirely trying to create some sort of ideological or intellectual basis for renewed uh, interventionism. In practice, Britain's interventionism is slightly circumscribed by the fact that it can't really do much intervening unless the USA is prepared to lead or at least support it, as it did in Libya. Uh, but um, but there will be an attempt now to, with Biden in the USA, who's a more sort of European friendly president than Trump was, to, to re-normalise uh, the politics of intervention, which is why it is so important that we keep on hammering home in the Labour Party the lessons of the Iraq disaster. Almost no one defends the Iraq war now. I mean, even the people writing the open Labour uh, pamphlet, I think, I think no one other than Nick Cohen uh, in the whole of British politics and media now defends the Iraq war. Uh, but um, they will attempt to say the next one is, uh, is different because this is hardwired into the uh, uh, the, the DNA of the British establishment, the right to intervene. And the question about um, Latin America, uh, well, I mean, yes, there have been many threats of intervention, I think particularly against, uh, uh, against uh, Venezuela. Um, what we have to do is, is reassert the uh, importance of self-determination and national sovereignty. Uh, in my view, it's not necessary for us in Britain to underwrite every policy of any regime that has been threatened by the Americans, but it is necessary to say that countries have a right to set their own course, uh, to uh, not have external interference, uh, external pressure, uh, whether it is inter military intervention or punitive sanctions, uh, and uh, you know to you know to assert the basic principles of international uh, democracy. Now, I think, Amy, I've forgotten one of the questions or missed it out. Um, I don't know if you could remind me, possibly. Yeah, sure, Andrew. Um, so we, we had a question about, um, well, it started with a, a discussion around Cuba um, mm. and about Cuba's solidarity and sending doctors to help in times of disaster and things like that. Um, and it was just about how can we draw attention to different types of intervention, um, such as you know the, the US blockade and coups and sanctions and increase the standard of economic and proxy wars. Yeah, well, that's an important point. I mean, I think, I think Sam, in his introduction, raised an important uh, issue about what is internationalism. Uh, I mean, in the, the, the coinage has been debased by the Labour right wing, who, in its most benign form, say internationalism must mean unconditional commitment to the European Union. And in its still worse form, say it must be, involve... Um, uh, support for NATO and uh, internationalism is expressed by intervention. What Cuba does is real internationalism, uh, you know, selflessly helping uh, other uh, countries uh, uh, deal with health uh, emergencies, not looking for profit, uh, but putting the resources that a socialist Cuba has developed itself uh, at the disposal of wider uh, humanity. Uh, and I mean, the blockading of Cuba um, over uh, more than 60 years uh, now uh, uh, is, is a form of imperialist intervention. It has been repeatedly condemned at the UN General Assembly. Um, it's not even really supported by the British government. Uh, it, it is um, uh, an act of bellicose uh, US uh, bullying. And it is, of course, a sort of proxy, uh, a proxy war. They've tried to launch real wars against Cuba, with, but with no great... Uh, a great success. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, we have to, I mean, that's the thing about imperialism, you know, it's a, a world system. And, you know, you can talk about Cuba elsewhere in Latin America, you can talk about what's happening in, uh, uh, in Africa, there's been a huge focus on the Middle East and South Asia this uh, century. Uh, but you can find imperialism operating militarily, and economically, politically, and diplomatically in almost every part of the world. And it operates in different registers. It's not always just armed invasion. In fact, that is relatively seldom. Um, but uh, uh, you, you're raising an, uh, an awareness of this that does mean looking at the world as a whole, looking at the world order as a whole, looking at how we've got here and how we need to get someplace else. And that and getting a sort of a political framing for the individual decisions one takes on foreign policy uh, and the campaigns uh, uh, that we run, but having uh, uh, an understanding of what it is we are um, uh, uh, opposing, uh, and rather than just chasing after particular issues as aberrations or somehow departures from the norm, 
see that it is the norm that is the problem. Cheers, Andrew. Um, over to Sam for his response. Uh, yeah, on, so on the Washington consensus question and the kind of institutions like the IMF and the World Bank, absolutely. Like again, uh, looking at Latin America, that's that's been the modus operandi. Like there's an economic crisis, and then the the country wants to go to um, the bank for a loan, and and then strings are attached to that, which involve privatization and like massive levels of austerity. What I would say too, however, and this kind of links into the what can we do to draw more attention. Um, uh, to, to the kind of forms of um, the proxy wars and those kind of economic wars and things like that that are going on um, going on across across that region um, is actually like I said in, I said in my kind of intro like our alliance internationally shouldn't be with um, our own ruling class against the rest of the world it should be with a it should be with all the people who are struggling against imperialism everywhere. Um, I think that's the thing that kind of, like I say, separates us from other bits of the left um, and the kind of sort of banal nationalism of kind of people like, and, you know, Lisa Nandy's latest thing, which is, I just, I think it's woolly in terms of meaning. Um, and that means, yeah, but one of the interventions that imperialism makes is to try and stop you from doing that and the people who do come under attack. So I remember um, Ken Livingston when he ran, um, uh, the, uh, the, the when, he, when he was a London mayor, you know, this kind of oil for expertise deal and things like that that came up. Um, and that was that was decried as some sort of, you know, horrendously kind of um, stupid, mad thing that people shouldn't be getting involved in. And like um, one of the things that imperialism does is it tries to break up your solidarity with um, people who are fighting against things like austerity and privatisation that are imposed at gunpoint or um, at risk of economic crisis. And so I think it's really, really important that we reach out to the organisations and the people um, who, who, who are struggling against those things in those countries. So I, I would encourage everyone, if they're not a member, for example, to get involved in the Brazil Solidarity Initiative, to get involved in the Venezuela Solidarity Campaign, the Palestine Solidarity Campaign, all of these kind of solidarity campaigns are about expressing, um, you know, expressing um, support for the resistance to imperialism that's happening abroad. Um, finally, just on the kind of Iraq war question um, and the normalization of liberal intervention, I think the significance of the um, struggle against the Iraq war in British politics can't be overstated. Um, like Andrew said, okay, fine, what happened, but it's, you know, it's resonated. It's the, uh, it's the reason that I'm on this call right now. Like the first demonstration I was ever involved in, I was 15 years old and I occupied Portsmouth University and that was in the run-up to the Iraq war like, and that's why I'm here um, and I think there is a layer a, like a, a layer of activists for whom that really resonates and will continue to resonate um, no more Iraqs I think st st people still understand what that means now um, so absolutely and just to kind of say too um, and pick up on the point that Andrew raised about about the purpose of these documents and I, 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 maybe I, this is too too sharp a way of putting it, but frankly, I mean, really, like the open labour thing, that this kind of opposition, we you know, we should drop our obsession with anti-imperialism. The purpose of those interventions is to rehabilitate, is to re rehabilitate, um, like kind of liberal interventionism. I don't really think they can be kind of conceived as anything other than that. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Sam. OK, we do have one final round of questions, um, which I'll put to you in a second. Um, but before we do that, I just wanted to take a chance to thank everyone for taking part this afternoon and obviously a particular thank you to our speakers. Um, to everyone watching, please do make a donation um, if you can afford to do so. The links are provided in the um, chat boxes. And this is just so Liberal Outlook can increase its web presence and continue to put on events like this. Um, we really hope that you've enjoyed this event in particular. Um, our next discussion is going to be why socialists support the global Palestinian resistance, which is another much needed discussion, led by Hugh Lanning from Labour and Palestine. And, and Hugh is a lifelong campaigner who has been chair of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign, um, a Labour parliamentary candidate and deputy general secretary of the PCS union. And on the, on the 3rd of July, we've also got a forum on why socialists support a united island um, with Chris Hazard from Sinn Féin, and Rachel Garnham from CLPD. So please do join us for those and make sure that you follow Labour Outlook um, on Twitter and Facebook as well to keep up to date with what we're doing. Um, so I'll now put the final questions to our speakers and I'll ask them as well um, to sum up if they'd like to join these um, responses as well. 
So our questions are um, from Angus on Zoom. Um, to what extent do workers benefit in Britain from imperialism? And how does that affect the building of global solidarity? Um, secondly, the Black Lives Matter protests focus attention on Britain's role in slavery and how that history continues to shape our institutions and society today. How can we make sure that, that there is more understanding in Britain of our history and the role of empire and colonialism in shaping today's world and current conflicts? And related to that, this, um, this questioner has asked, do you have any suggested books or readings on that topic? And finally, do you think that the pandemic um, has shown how interdependent countries are? Has that created the opportunity for more support for ending imperialist injustice? And how can we build on that to get the um, debt of developing economies cancelled and call for more international sharing of the vaccine? Okay, so those are our final questions. If you'd also like to sum up um, any comments that you want to make as well in your responses to these, and then the event will end after this round. Um, so Andrew, to you first. Yeah, well, obviously the first question is, it's a very long standing one, to what extent the British workers or benefit from imperialism um and i mean the, the, there's a, a very big literature grappling with this question and it's it has to do obviously with the labor theory of value and whether um labor is uh, labor power sold it over its value in britain and and so on and so forth it's you know you get into the mechanics of international uh, exploitation it's a uh, it's a complex uh, uh, issue. And certainly there is an argument that because uh, a lot of the wealth produced elsewhere in the world throughout the imperial period has been transferred back to Britain and the USA and a portion of that has been shared and used, you know, would we have a stronger welfare state, uh, even in its present depleted condition, if it hadn't been for those mechanics of international exploitation? Those are all serious areas for debate, but I think politically we have to say Britain would be Britain would be better without imperialism. The British people would live better without imperialism. We would live in a better society if imperialism was uh, challenged. In opening, I tried to outline some of the ways in which uh, maintaining imperialism costs Britain and the British people. Uh, in distorting uh, our economic priorities, in wasting vast sums of money uh, on uh, military and other uh, you know, international imperial projects, in dividing our society along lines of uh, racism and in inhibiting the tackling of social problems. Uh, I mean, in, in a way, imperialism is the form that capitalism takes in Britain. And if you're going to break with imperialism, you're breaking with capitalism and vice versa. So yes, I think the Br British people would live better without imperialism. I think we have to be absolutely categorical about that and spell out the ways that if Britain was not playing the role of a, a so-called international policeman at the US's side, uh, it would um, be better for British society in multiple, uh, in multiple ways. Uh, it's probably more fruitful to go down that road rather than you know looking at the transfer of uh, value important although that that is um yeah i mean i think the black lives matter has really raised the consciousness of britain's imperial history uh, uh and uh, the, you know the toppling of the statues and i mean the hysterical responses received from the right wing uh that they, they feel really threatened by any challenge to the prevailing uh, our island story uh, narrative of history. Um, and uh, uh, I think it's going to be hard to put the genie back in the bottle because actually the British Empire historically has relatively few defenders. I mean, there's, you know, there's some historians like Niall Ferguson and Andrew Roberts who do, but there's the relatively few. And I mean, there's like a very good book come out, Empire Land, um, uh, published this year um, by a British BAM author. Uh, there's many others uh, coming out. Um, there, there is now a, a growing body of black British writers who address this question from one way um, uh, or another. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, so I, I, I think that it 
that will be deepened, but it could be deepened much further and faster if the left really got on board with the programme, if they didn't see this as being a sort of fringe uh, thing. Um, which I'm not saying most of the left does, but some of the left does definitely. Uh, and, um, you know, said, you know, we, we have to, you know, deepen our understanding of Britain's uh, uh, history. I would recommend one of my own books, um, The Imperial Controversy, but it's not widely available, so it's probably not a lot of point. But if you, if you can find it, I do try and address uh, some of these things. Now, whether the pandemic will actually lead to... Um, uh, I think it has it has foregrounded issues of international solidarity uh, and uh, uh, the you know the need to grapple with these questions internationally. And I don't think that the um, great powers are really distinguishing themselves in that struggle particularly. So I think it 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 adds to the case for a different world order, uh, you know, based on uh, equality and a measure of international control and planning of economic uh, uh, issues and indeed obviously medical and environmental ones uh, as well. So it strengthens the argument, although whether on its own it will actually undermine imperialism, I would rather doubt. Undermining imperialism is, is a sort of conscious political thing. It's not going to happen um, uh, spontaneously. So I think that answers the questions, uh, Amy. Um, I mean, just to uh, conclude, yeah, I'd like to pick up on something Sam, you know, was saying about the importance of the movement against the Iraq war. Uh, I think one of the consequences of the movement against the Iraq war and, and people like Sam who are drawn into politics around that time was the election of Jeremy Corbyn as Labour leader. Um, I don't believe he would have been elected leader had it not been for his own deep engagement in the anti-war movement uh, and, and the sense that that was the greatest disaster of the new Labour government and that the Labour Party membership wanted to, to move on from. And I think they're going to quite find it quite hard to go back uh, on that. I mean, Corbynism, one of its achievements was it did place anti-imperialism at the heart of British politics. Uh, the attack on it from within the Labour right shows how threatening that that is. And it, it was the aspect of Corbynism that they could live with least, that they were most uh, opposed to. And, uh, you know, because it represents a break with collaboration with the ruling class, which is what Labour right wing has been in business for for the last uh, 100, uh, 100 years. So, yes, I mean, this is a vital question for uh, left uh, advance. And if we are to get another leader as uh, left wing and as principled as Jeremy Corbyn elected at some point in the future, uh, it will be in part uh, because we grasp the questions that we've been discussing here today. Thank you. Brilliant, thanks Andrew. And Sam, for your responses and sum up. Um, yeah, so uh, I kind of, I, I definitely agree with Andrew on the, the answer to the first question uh, around um, do workers benefit from imperialism? Um, I, I just think after, probably after 10 years of wage stagnation and or more in fact now of, and casualization and um like living standards being crushed it's politically probably not like <laughs> it's not the most useful question to ask actually it's like that for me i think always the question is how do you draw the interests of the people here um into the same alliance as as people struggling abroad like um and that's that should be our political problematic i think so um so yeah i wholeheartedly agree with what i um, said on that um on understanding of empire and colonialism um yeah like i said earlier on that like it's it's um actually like that you know the what's interesting about just an observation observation about blm and um and the, the statue controversy and all of those sorts of things actually that started off as an international movement as well so which kind of it like really kind of um illustrates the importance of a kind of international politics and, and keeping an eye on internationalism and actually like you know that that blm insurgency came off of the back of an international outrage um or wow well, an outrage committed in the us which was then internationalized um so i think that's really really important um 
on the on, on reading uh, just a second to I have read the Imperial Controversy. It's, it's a great book. <laughs> you should definitely try and get a hold of it. Um, uh, Richard Gott's book actually on British Empire is also really, really good. I found that really, really helpful. Um, uh, again, like just personal interest in Latin America, Open Veins of Latin America is a brilliant book which charts sort of um, uh, British intervention into, into Latin America. Um, finally, on the kind of pandemic um, and anti-imperialism, um, I think uh, absolutely there's a, um, again, there's an opportunity to make an argument there because I, I think that's the countries I've, I might, I, I think, um, the countries that have been most affected um, by the pandemic, I think are probably the ones that are most tightly integrated into that, that imperial system. Like, and again, I'm, I'm thinking about um, uh, the US and in, in, in Britain, you know, <laughs> our responses have been completely um, uh, completely inadequate. Uh, Bolsonaro's um, uh, response in Brazil was 250,000 people are dead. I think it was about 1% of the population, it's, which is, again, it, uh, a crazy amount of people who have died. Um, so absolutely, I think that kind of, um, the, the pandemic has certainly hit, hit the country's hardest that are most integrated into um, that kind of, in, that imperial, um, that imperial network, political network. Um, and yeah, finally, just, I, I don't know, in, in terms of my kind of sum up, um, sum up remark, um, again, to echo Andrew's point, I think it's no accident that um, the, uh, if you see what happened in 2015 is the expression of broader political trends in society. Um, and actually what Jeremy Corbyn did was um, act as the lightning rod of all those kind of people who had, who had been crushed by, you know, in the wake of the 2008 crisis um, through austerity. Um, actually, like the kind of traditional sort of social democratic soft left was left, like, had abandoned his post. You know, if you look at kind of Ed Miliband in the uh, 2015 general election, um, he'd abandoned even a um, consistent opposition to austerity. Um, I think it's no accident, you know, in terms of accepting overall Tory spending envelopes, I think it's no accident the person who was the most consistent opponent of austerity was also um, the most consistent opponent of, um, of imperialism, um, in, uh, certainly in Parliament. So, um, so yeah, absolutely, I think kind of um, Corbynism and anti-imperialism, and I, this, is the, this is the note that I'll end on, was not a weakness. It was the precondition of its um, success in the Labour Party from 2015, um, certainly like through through to 2017 and afterwards. Um, uh, yeah, well, I'll, I'll end on that. <laughs> Amy, can I just come up on the literature just to mention that book I mentioned, Empire Land, by Satnam Sangira, who's a, a, a British academic, and also this one, The New Age of Empire, by Kahinde Andrews. Those are both written by black British academics, specialists in these fields, and they're both well worth reading. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Andrew, and thank you everyone for joining us today and for taking part.